بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أجمعين سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا يا كريم Dear colleagues, now we will start a new series of lectures about the uh, female uh, imaging and um, as you all know that I don't have uh, enough experience in the breast imaging but I can handle some of the uh, pelvic uh, female imaging and this will be uh, provided in about four lectures dealing with the uh, anatomy and pathology of the uh, female uh, pelvic organs. And uh, these are the items for discussion. I will provide some of the uh, anatomy and techniques of examination. Then we will talk about uh, uterine lymiomas, then uh, uterine adenomyosis, and then the second part of this talk will handle the issue of endometrial carcinoma and uh, will end by the cervical cancer. And in two other separate lectures, I will deal with ovarian pathology and the rest of the uh, organs like uh, next lesions of vaginal pathology and so on. And you know that uh, to examine the, the pelvis for male and female, we usually use almost the same technique, but this, in the female uh, patient, we would like to have some uh, precautions and some more uh, preparations uh, so that we can we are able to uh, adequately delineate the pelvic organs especially the ovaries which are uh, uh, somewhat difficult to be delineated by CT scan then in the CT technique we use usually uh, some gastrography to opacify uh, the bowel loops and we may need in some specific cases to inject gastrography in the rectum to opacify the distal part of the colon. Sometimes we need to put the vaginal tampons uh, especially whenever we are evaluating lesions in the uterine cervix or lesions in the proximal part of the vagina. And in many conditions we usually need to inject the contrast medium this is the regular dose for the adult uh, female. Uh, the pelvis is scanned from the level of the iliac crest until we finish by the uh, pubic symphysis or even more down to uh, cover the area of the anal canal and the uh, ischiorectal fossa. And uh, we use a somewhat a small field of view to include uh, the whole pelvis and to delineate the organs in a good manner. Sometimes we need to uh, have the sagittal and coronal reformatted images which are uh, usually helpful in almost all of the uh, cases. Uh, this is the uh, regular anatomy of the pelvis and you know we start almost near to the iliac crest where we do not usually see anything apart from the bowel loops and we can see the inferior part of the left kidney as in this case and also the inferior part of the liver then you can see the aorta and the IVC lower down we still we can uh, identify the bowel loops which are delineated by the orally administrated contrast material. And lower down, we still see the bowel loops and the, the uh, psoas muscle and the, the vessels on both sides. Then uh, more lower down, you will uh, see the uterine fundus or the uterine colpus, the body of the uterus. And sometimes you can uh, identify one or both ovaries as a small round or oval shaped structures on both sides of the uterine columns. Lower down you can reach the uh, region of the 
renal canal and the ischio rectal fossa. And here in this example, you see the uterine corpus, and lower down, this is the urinary bladder, this is the uterine cervix, which is located between the bladder and the rectum, as you will know. And this is the final image when you reach the, the, the distal part of the cervix. And this is the vaginal vault. This is the anal canal. And this is the urinary bladder. And here, of course, the ischiorectal fossa filled by fat on both sides. And sometimes we may, uh, uh, we may prepare the bowel using water or mannitol in order to distend the small bowel loops and to separate them from uh, other pelvic structures. But in most of the cases, uh, the radiologists usually feel uh, somewhat familiar with the gastrographene in the bowel loops. And this is the coronal reformatted image of the CT scan after contrast uh, injection. And you can see the, the uterus with the endometrial cavity, which is not enhancing, similar to the uh, myometrium, for example. And this is the axial image. This is the uterine corpus, endometrial cavity, and this is the uh, rectum. The sagittal image will show the uh, full configuration of the uterus, including the fundus, the body, and the cervical canal. An MRI is, of course, considered uh, as one of the most important imaging techniques for evaluation of the female pelvis nowadays, in particular the uterus and uh, whenever you are uh, uh, in the way to stage some of the uh, neoplastic lesions as we will see. Then uh, the usual examination technique is uh, performed by uh, one of the high field uh, scanners and we use one of the, uh, the pelvic or torso phase array coil and there is no special bowel preparation needed for MRI except that you may inject some spasmolytic agent to reduce the bowel prostheses to avoid some artifacts. Then the patients are instructed to void prior the examination. And uh, of course, nowadays the examination is not that long, so the patient can tolerate the, the exam without the need to go to the toilet. Then the standard position is the comfortable supine position for examination and we use all the available pulse sequences including the T1 and T2 and we may be the gradient images in the axial, sagittal and the coronal planes. We select the field of view which is suitable for the patient size and we usually scan the pelvis at 5 mm slice thickness we will leave about two millimeter inter-slice gap and in many conditions we need to inject the contrast material. It's better to examine the, the female patient in the second half of the menstrual cycle, but this is not a rule. Sometimes, as I have said, we may use the vaginal tampons, especially whenever we are examining the uh, cervix and the, uh, the vagina. And this is the uh, menstrual cycle starting by the uh, menstrual phase followed by the proliferative phase and this is the secretory phase. And this is the uh, ovulation or the ovarian cycle starting by the primary follicle, the secondary follicle, then the vesicular follicle which you will ovulate and uh, transform it into the corpus Luteum then uh, progresses to the corpus or degenerates to the corpus albicans. I will examine, uh, I will um, um, uh, touch this, uh, this issue in detail uh, in, in the section of ovarian uh, pathology. Then uh, one of the important pulse sequences which should never be omitted 
in the examination of the female pelvis is the sagittal T2 weighted images. And this is very important to assess the uh, uterine anatomy and uh, most of the uterine pathology, especially whenever you are uh, inquired about the zonal anatomy and endometrial pathology. Then uh, sometimes uh, many of the radiologists will prefer the axial oblique images which are obtained perpendicular to the axis of the uterine body. And one of the important issues is uh, sometimes you need to scan the upper abdomen for possible uh, renal pathology, especially in cases with uterine anomalies. And also in cases of malignancies, searching for metastatic deposits. And in the uh, reproductive uh, age, the uterus will appear like this. And um, the size of the uterus is about uh, 6 to 9 centimeter long. And its weight is about uh, 50 grams. The uterine cavity is lined by endometrium which is of bright signal and the T2 weighted image. And you know the fluids are of bright signal in the T2 weighted image. Also the fluid in the urinary bladder is bright. Then you see the, this dark band which is known as the junctional zone. And you see the gray, uh, the gray muscles of the muscles of the, of the uterine uh, body which will appear of intermediate signal in the T2-weighted image. And you can continue into the cervical canal, and this is the upper part of the, uh, of the vagina. You know that the uterus is um, an extra peritoneal organ. It is covered on its surface by the uh, peritoneal cavity, which is, which is also covered the, the uh, urinary bladder vault. And uh, one of the issues uh, that uh, our colleagues used to comment upon in every examination of the uh, female pelvis is the position of the uterus. And you know this is the normal position. And sometimes the uterus is antiverted, and there are some degrees for this antiversion. But you see here, this is the uterus, which is uh, totally antiverted uh, lying in the pre-sacral area. This will not interfere with the uh, pregnancy, for example, and it will not produce any symptoms. Then one of the incidental findings that we uh, may uh, face during our examination is that you can uh, see some uh, cystic lesions, small cysts in the uterine cervix, and these are known as Nabothian cysts. They are uh, retention cysts in the cervical mucous glands, and they are benign, of course, containing fluid or mucus. They appear of bright signal in the T2-weighted image. They are considered by many as an incidental find. And if you have the sagittal reconstructed image of the uterus by CT, you cannot, of course, see the zonal anatomy. But you can, you are able to measure the uterine size, and you see the contour, and also you assess the thickness of the uh, 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 myometrium, for example, and to see masses coming out from the body of the uterus. But... In order to appreciate the zonal anatomy, which is made of the three layers I have mentioned, it, it, there should be a, an MRI, and uh, this should be in the T2-weighted image and preferred to be in the sagittal plane. And here, you see the endometrial cavity, and you see the junctional zone, and you see the myometrium, which is of intermediate signal. The junction zone is dark, and the endometrium is bright. The junctional zone normal thickness should not exceed 5 millimeter. And uh, this is very
very helpful in the assessment of the uterine adenomyosis where you can see that there is significant increase of the thickness of the junctional zone as I will mention and it is stated that the thickness of the junctional zone over 12 millimeter is diagnostic of uh, adenomyosis. Then you know that there are several changes which occur in the uterus during the menstrual cycle. This is the proliferative phase where you can see the zonal anatomy uh, uh, in the, the T2 weighted image. The endometrium is bright, the junctional zone is thin, and it is dark. The myometrium is gray. Then in the mid-secretory phase, you see that the, there is appreciable thickening of the myometrium, uh, relative distension of the uterine cavity, and the thinning of the junctional zone. In the menstrual phase, you see some blood clots inside the uterine cavity, and you see that uh, it is regaining its uh, normal configuration and signal intensity. And in order to see the value of T2 weighted imaging, you can look to the same images in the T1 weighted image. In the T1 weighted image, you see the shadow of the uterus, and you cannot identify the zonal anatomy. But in the T2 weighted images, in the axial and the sagittal plane, you can see the zonal anatomy, you can see the endometrial cavity, and you can differentiate between the junctional zone and the, the myometrium. And this is uh, the appearance of the uterus uh, during the uh, menstrual cycle. This is uh, T1 and this is T2 with the image. And you can see, you know, that the, uh, the phase by the presence of uh, blood clots inside the uterine cavity. And uh, this is an important issue. If you uh, you can look here and you see some loss of definition of the junctional zone and uh, relative abnormal signal in the myometrium. But uh, the scan obtained immediately after this one showed normal appearance. And this is known as transient uterine contractions, which may uh, uh, disturb the signal intensity of the myometrium leading to a false impression that you are dealing with, uh, for example, a focal uh, adenomyosis, for example, but this is just a simple contraction. And with, with we, in the next image or in the other series, you will see the normal junction, the normal zonal anatomy. Then the endo, uh, um, the cervix has a um, some different uh, anatomic details uh, when compared to the, the uterine body, but uh, this is one of the issues that you should uh, notice during the examination is the presence of uh, high signal faults within the endocervical canal, and these are uh, uh, known as the balmit faults, which are considered a normal find. Then this is the appearance of the uterus and the, the cervix in the T1 weighted images and in the T2 weighted images. In the T2, you are able to see the cervical stroma, the endocervical canal, and uh, 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 in the T1 weighted image, these details are usually masked. And after menopause, it is expected that the, utera, the uterus is getting smaller and uh, the myometrium uh, has a lower signal compared to the myometrium in the reproductive period. This is uh, the postmenopausal uterus and the, you can notice that the myometrium now is relatively more dark compared to the intermediate signal of the uh, myometrium in the uh, younger age or before menopause. Then um, 
the junctional zone is not well defined and the endometrial cavity is small or atrophic as you can see here but the cervix is not liable for these changes the cervix may maintain its normal size and the um, zonal anatomy and then <coughs> sorry we'll start the uh, pathologic lesions that occur in the uh, <coughs> in the uterus and we'll start by the uh, congenital anomalies affecting the uterus and the tubes then you know that uh, the uterine corpus the isthmus the cervix and the upper two-thirds of the vagina are derived from the Mullerian ducts while the lower third of the vagina is derived from a separate structure which is the urogenital sinus then these are two separate entities and each will be liable to abnormalities related to the uh, site of origin. The congenital anomalies of the uterus are uncommon and they represent about 1-3% to of the population. The, these anomalies are usually uh, diagnosed by many radiologic techniques that was uh, previously the hysterosalpingography was one of the major tools that's still used up till now for evaluation of suspected uterine anomalies then the transabdominal ultrasound and transvaginal ultrasound sonohistrography and uh, MRI of course is one of the uh, most accurate tools for evaluation of congenital anomalies of the uterus. Then the anomalies will present clinically according to the age of the patient. In the childbearing age, the patient may present by infertility or uh, spontaneous abortion or premature delivery or uh, fetal intrauterine cross retardation or difficulties during delivery while in infants uh, they will they they will present by may present by hydro vitrocorpus distension of the vagina and the, the uterine cavity by secretions or in adolescence after the start of uh, the menses they may present by amenorrhea amenorrhea or hematometrocorpus meaning that the, the, the vagina and the, the uterus are distended by blood <coughs> then this uh, is the diagrammatic representation of the possible uterine anomalies this is the normal appearance of the uterus and this is what we call unicorn uterus and this is uterus didelphis with two separate uterine uh, cavities and two separate cervical canals and there may be in most of the cases a vaginal septum as well then by cornute uterus uh, there is some separation between two bodies of the uh, of the uterus but they usually unite at some uh, distance from the fundus into a single uterine cavity and maybe a single uh, cervix Sometimes in cases of bicornate uterus, you have two uterine cornea that are fused at a certain distance, but each uterine uh, cornea has its own cervical canal. And this may simulate the uterus didelphis, but you remember that the, the uterus didelphis, there are two separate uterine cavities and two separate cervical canals but here there is some way fusion between the uh, uterine uh, corpus on the left and on the right but each one has its own endometrial cavity 
and this is what we call the septate uterus where the configuration of the uterus is maintained but the cavity is septated and you see it depends on the size of the septum the septum may be may involve the whole cavity and this is septate and involve part of the uterine cavity and this is subseptate uterus and sometimes the septate uterus may have also a septum in the vagina and finally you get the arc with uterus with some fundal depression but the configuration of the uterus the cavity the cervical canal are maintained we we'll start by group one or class one uh, uterine anomalies which are uh, known as dysgenesis of the uterus and here you have uh, agenesis or hypoplasia of the uterus as well as the upper two thirds of the vagina. You can see a very small size uterine cavity but the tubes are present and they are patent with normal peritoneal spill and this is through salpingogram. And this is what we call infantile uterus where you see the size of the uterus is very small but the fallopian tubes are maintained, they are normally developed and also they are patent spilling the injected contrast material into the uterine cavity. The class 2 is unicornate uterus and uh, that's to say that we have a, a single uterine cornea with the second one is rudimentary or atrophic and sometimes no other cornea is present many times you get a cornea but it is not connected to the uterine cavity or you got a rudimentary cornea which is connected to the uterine cavity. If the cornea is connected to the uterine cavity, it will fill with contrast material during his true cell geography. But if not, and uh, you see here only one uterine cornea, you may expect that there is no other cornea at all, or the cornea is present, but it is not connected to the uterine cavity. And this information is only obtained by MRI or by the transvaginal ultrasound. In many cases, in this congenital anomaly, you got some renal uh, malformations as well. And here you got, you see, a single uterine cornea, a single uh, 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 fallopian tube, and um, the possibility of another atrophic cornea needs further evaluation by MRI. In this case, by hysterocell angiography, you see a single uterine cornea, and by MRI, you see a single cornea. This is the rectum, which is distended by fecal matter, and you cannot appreciate the presence of another rudimentary cornea. And this is the same case. Here you see single cornea by hysterocell angiography, and you see the cornea well demonstrated by MRI T2 image with no rudimentary hole. And you came to the uh, second or the third class, which is uterus didelphs, where there is complete non-fusion of the Morarian ducts with formation of two separate uterine cavities and two separate cervical canals. And the vaginal septum is usually present in about 75% of cases. And here, by hysterocell angiography, you may need to introduce two hysterocell angiography cannula, cannulas for a, a, a evaluation. And you put the cannula in, in one of the cervical canals and another cannula in the second cervical canal, then you got the opacification of the uterine cornea. And this is uterus didelphs. You should remember that in uterus didelphs, there are two separate uterine bodies, two separate uterine cavities, two separate cervical canals. But sometimes it's difficult to, to, uh, to say for sure if this is a, a, let's say, 
uh, uterus didalis or bicornate uterus, then you should remember that the bicornate uterus, there is some fusion between the bodies of the, uh, of the uterus and at some distance from the region of the fundus. And here is the uterus didalis. You can see two separate uterine cavities, two separate cervical canals. And um, this is uterus didalis with a fibroid mass inside the uh, uterine cavity here. You see the body of the uterus on the left with its cervical canal, the body of the uterus on the right with its cervical canal, but the uterine cavity is distended by this low signal mass, which is characteristic of uterine fibroid, as I will mention later on. In bicornate uterus, there is some fusion between the uh, bodies of the, of the uterus, and uh, there may be a, sing, a, a single cavity um, um, at a distance from the fundus, or there may be two separate uterine cavities and two separate cervical canals. And this is the appearance of the bicornate uterus. There is a fundal cleft, which is more than one centimeter from the external uterine contour. And you see, this is the body of the uterus. The body of the uterus on the right side, endometrial cavities, they are fused here into a single cervical canal. This is what we call bicornate uniculus uterus. And sometimes you, uh, you got two separate uterine bodies and two separate cervical canals. But here you see the bicornate uniculus uterus with a single cervical canal, which uh, uh, is um, the, the uterine bodies are opacified by single cannula, introducing into a single cervical canal. And this is bicornate uterus, where you see there is some fusion between the bodies of the uterus, and then um, you see the endometrial cavity, and here you got two separate cervical canals included in a single uh, cervix. Then this is bicornate uterus, another example, two separate uterine cavities, two separate cervical canals, but you see the fusion of the uh, uterine bodies here, and this is by corneate, by cullus uterus. And uh, the scans of the abdomen showed that there is a single kidney on the right side, which shows compensatory hypertrophy, where the left kidney is not present. And septate uterus means that the uterine cavity or the configuration of the uterus is almost within normal, but there is a septum within the cavity, and this septum may be complete, as you can see here, or uh, incomplete like this one, which is called the subseptate uterus. This type of uterine anomaly, according to the literature, has the poorest reproductive outcome. And then... Um, here you see a cleft which is less than one centimeter from the uterine fundus, and this is what we call the uh, the subseptate uterus, and this is also subseptate uterus. You see a, a cleft uh, uh, within the uterine cavity, dividing the uh, a cavity into two. Then there is fusion of both cavities into a single cervical canal. CT, of course is the least of the imaging modalities to uh, identify uterine anomalies, but may, sometimes you can see this as an incidental finding looking for other pathology. And here, this is the uterus. There are two in separate endometrial cavities with a septum in between, and this is septate uterus, by CT. This is subseptate uterus with a septum in near the uterine fundus, dividing the cavity into two parts with a single uh, cervical canal, and the, this arrow points to an incidentally found uterine fibroid. And this is also an example of a septate uterus, partial septation 
with two endometrial cavities in a single cervical canal. Then arcuate uterus is uh, considered by many as a normal variant. There is uh, some depression in the uterine fundus as seen by MRI and also by hysterosalpingography, as you can see here. And this arcuate uterus has no negative effects on pregnancy. This is arcuate uterus, and there is some hydrosalpings on the left side, but the right tube is patent, spilling contrast material in the peritoneal cavity. Then this is arcuate uterus, and you see this frontal depression. This is the endometrial cavity, which is not divided, and um, you see the junctional zone, and also you can appreciate the, the uterus with the ovary, sorry. Then we start by one of the common pathologies affecting the uh, uterus, and this is the uterine lymphomas or the uterine fibroids. This is considered the, the most common uterine benign tumor, and the incidence is about 25 uh, to 50%. Um, about 10% of lymphomas will occur in the surface but most of the uterine fibroids are seen in the uterine corpus. This is uh, very common in uh, uh, patients with, with, no, uh, with no children and also is very common after menopause. Then uh, the clinical presentation of uterine fibroid will include abnormal menstrual bleeding uh, menorrhagia and of course with consequent uh, anemia secondary to the blood loss. Uh, pelvic pressure symptoms if the, the uterine fibroid is large it will compress the urinary bladder and it will also compress the rectum and sometimes it may uh, interfere with pregnancy or may lead to some complications during pregnancy. Uterine fibroids can be diagnosed by the brain X-ray if you see this finding, a mass which is calcified in the pelvis of a female patient. And then the diagnosis of uterine fibroid is the most uh, common diagnosis for this appearance. This is also a uterine fibroid incidentally discovered during an intravenous urography for assessment of uh, urinary symptoms and um, if you perform hysterosalpingography you can see that the uterine cavity is enlarged and you may appreciate some filling defects inside the uterine cavity and this is the submucous fibroid or you may get enlargement of the uterine cavity with irregular borders and this will be secondary to fibroids in the wall of the uterus what we call interstitial fibroids and this is the appearance of fibroid by ultrasound it will appear hypochoic and if you use the Doppler facility you can see some vascularity within the mass and this is the appearance by CT and you got a lobulated mass which is of almost similar density to the muscles of the uterus and uh, this mass may be small, may be large, and usually it contains uh, calcification in up to 10% of, uh, of the cases. And this is the uterine cavity, this is the uterine, uh, the myometrium, and there is a mass here, and this is uterine fibroid. The fibroid uh, will appear in the CT images of similar CT density and the enhancement to the myometrium. But sometimes, due to uh, some degenerative changes in the fibroid uh, mass, it will appear somewhat hypo uh, dense or less enhancing compared to, to the uh, myometrium. And this is a very big uterine uh, fibroid which uh, contains a lot of dystrophic calcifications, as you can see. And this is the fibroid uh, uterus. 
with within the fibroid mass or within the lymphoma, you can see hypodensities, and these are due to uh, some kind of degeneration within the fibroid, including cystic and hyaline degeneration, and also there may be fatty degeneration within the uterine lymphoma. And this is cystic degeneration within uterine fibroids. You got some fluid density within the masses affecting the uh, body of the uterus. And this is also an example of fatty degeneration of uterine fibroid. You got some hypodensities representing fat uh, within the uh, uterine fibroid, which is uh, uh, as you can see, not enhancing as similar to the uh, myometry. By MRI, the uterine fibroid has a classic appearance, which is a well-defined mass, uh, either within the uterine cavity or within the myometrium or outside the uterus, the uterine cavity. And uh, this mass will appear of low signal in the T1 low signal in the T2 and it may show some contrast enhancement after gadolinium injection. Of course, you know that MRI is relatively insensitive for detection of calcium within the uterine fibroids. But this is a classic appearance whenever you see well-defined masses within the myometrium or inside the uterine cavity and this is known as the submucous fibroid this is interstitial fibroid and there is if there is a uterine fibroid here outside the uterus and this is the subserous fibroid and this is the sagittal t1 both to contrast with fat suppression you see the body of the uterus is large and you see the uterine uh, fibroids less enhancing compared to the enhancement of the myometry and sometimes if calcification is um, prominent it can appear on MR images as in this case this is the uterus and the low signal rim as well as the low signal dots represents this trophic calcification within this uterine fibroid and this is an example of a big uh, fibroid in the uh, in the fundus of the uterus and the smaller one nearby. Both lesions show dark signal uh, in the T2 weighted image and they show some enhancement after intravenous contrast injection and in this sagittal T1 fat subrest image. Then uh, uterine uh, uterine uh, fibroids may show some signal void vessels at the margin of the lesion because they are uh, they are vascular lesions they may undergo hyaline degeneration or cystic degeneration uh, or uh, the hemorrhagic degeneration myxoid degeneration a lot of degenerative changes may affect the uh, uterine fibroids and this will be reflected on the uh, uh, signal of the fibroid uh, mass you know the usual signal is dark in the T1 and T2 but if there is cystic it changes it will appear black in the T1 and bright in the T2 if there is hemorrhage it may appear bright in both T1 and T2 weighted images this is uh, multiple uterine fibroids this is the uterine cavity and uh, here is sub a mucus fibroid and this is another one with some uh, degenerative changes inside this is intramural or interstitial within the myometrium and this one is also within the myometrium this is the rectum of course containing some fecal material and one of the uh, management uh, procedures for uh, uterine fibroids which are big is to do a, a selective embolization of the uh, uterine artery. And in cases of big uterine fibroids, and um, you want to uh, uh, decrease the size or uh, let this fibroid shrink, 
basically embolize the uh, feeding artery. And this is an example of a huge uterine fibroid that was uh, treated by uh, uterine artery embolization. And this is the follow-up obtained six months after embolization, showing significant reduction in the size of the fibroid compared to the pre-embolization image. Manmir is an example. In the selected the uterine artery, you, and you inject an embolizing material, then uh, you got uh, uh, almost a, a dec marked decrease of the vascularity of the uterine fibroid, which will be reflected uh, later on uh, on the size of the uh, fibroid uterus, which will shrink. Then uh, sometimes you got uh, too many uterine fibroids involving most of the uterus, which will appear like this. There are numerous uterine fibroids within the cavity and within the wall. We call this uterine leiomyomatosis. Cervical fibroids will, or leiomyomas, uh, the incidence is about 10 or 6% of the uh, uterine fibroids. They will have the same uh, imaging findings similar to the uh, leiomyomas arising from the uh, body of the uterus. And they are liable for the same degenerative changes affecting the uterine myomas. And here you see a big uh, cervical lymyoma, which is protruding into the uh, proximal part of the vagina. And of course, the, the, the main differentiating issue here, as I will mention later on, is uh, to differentiate the uh, cervical uterine and cervical lymyoma from cervical carcinoma. Since the two other possibilities are considered extremely rare, which are lymphoma and melanoma. And here you see a uterine lymphoma, which is affecting the cervix. And uh, this is the appearance on the T2 weighted image, the appearance in the T1 weighted image, and the appearance after contrast injection with T1 fat suppression. Thank you very much.